You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Traditional psychiatry, integrative medicine, or just someone to talk to, Dr. Carly is here to provide moms with personal solutions so that they may experience whole body, mind, and well being at this most extraordinary time of motherhood. Now, please welcome the host of MD for Moms, Dr. Carly Snyder. Welcome. You are listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. I'm a reproductive and perinatal psychiatrist, meaning I work with women struggling with emotional symptoms throughout their reproductive years. I also am mom to three wonderful kids who are all my greatest blessings and also the source of my greatest anxieties and fears, like every other mom. This show, MD for Moms, is dedicated to helping women enjoy life more, to maximizing health and wellness, and to improving women's relationships with themselves and with others. So I'm going to remind you throughout this show that you can call in and ask questions directly on air. The number is 855-856-1380. Take advantage. We would love to hear from you. So today, we are going to take a one-week break from our Mama Docs series, where I've been introducing you to other physician moms, each of whom specializes in a different medical field, all of which are relevant to you, my listeners. But today, we're going to go and take a slight departure in that my guest is a man, though he is still a physician and a parent, and he is still going to explore something very important for you, my listeners. Do you know about Lyme disease? Do you know it can affect the brain, causing something called PANS? Do you know what PANDAS is? Well, if you don't, don't worry. You are not alone. And after today's show, you will know all about it, including what these acronyms actually mean and why it matters for us as parents and for our kids. My guest today is Dr. David Younger, who completed a three-year medicine residency before he completed his training in neurology, followed by three years of fellowship before he joined Columbia's faculty as an assistant professor. He was recruited to three Manhattan hospitals where he served as chief of neuromuscular diseases for almost two decades, already an established editor and author of several textbooks and over 200 research articles. Almost 35 years after graduating from Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons, Dr. Younger, as Clinical Associate Professor of Neurology and Adjunct Associate Professor of Public Health, completed a Master's of Science degree in Epidemiology and a Master's of Public Health degree at NYU. He wrote his thesis on PANDAS. His research recognized the beneficial effect of immune modulary therapy in PANDAS employing intravenous immune globulin. It was not until he returned to postgraduate training in public health that he discovered that he had an interest and talent in epidemiology research. Recognizing that there are many disorders that impact children that do not neatly fit into the designation of neurologic neurologic or psychiatric, there we go. So Dr. Younger paved the way for a doctorate degree in public health this fall to contribute to the emerging field of childhood inflammatory brain diseases. Well, welcome, David. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you, Carly. And I'm going to give a public thank you to David because he has been incredibly helpful and caring with my own daughter who has experienced some of the symptoms and issues we'll be talking about today. So as a parent, I can say that I understand 
how other parents feel in this scenario. And as a physician, I can say how interesting all of this is. So this is clearly a topic that's close to my heart and to my family. And frankly, I think it's close to, it should be close to many physicians' hearts because it's such an interesting, interesting topic. But before we even go into it, I want to ask you how you decide to go into neurology. Well, uh, neurology for me was the the frontier of science that really had a black box kind of appeal uh, where things can't be known with great certainty, but where um, uh, focusing on leads uh, can bring you to a lot of uh, wonderful conclusions. It's kind of like the greatest uh, puzzle, right? The brain. <laughs> exactly. And, and it takes a, a fair amount of expertise uh, and experience to uh, be in contact with all the various uh, presentations of a given illness as well. And how did you decide to then subspecialize more and go into epidemiology as well? Well, I felt a personal need to uh, have an impact on, um, on society um, and to uh, delve uh, more deeply into uh, research. But one, one needed to have the tools to really uh, analyze populations. Uh, you know, it's one thing to make a diagnosis in a given uh, individual, but it's another thing to try to craft public policy uh, and, and give convincing evidence to the um, a presence of a, of a given illness, like Zika virus, for example, uh, or for the importance of pandas uh, or Lyme disease uh, in larger populations. That that's, makes sense. Now, and what do you do now in terms of how is your practice, um, what, what is your focus of your practice? Well, I'm, I'm using my practice really as, a, as, as I always have as a jumping board for where I can make it uh, the greatest impact um, on people, uh, on p parents and their children. Uh, over the years, I found that uh, I can be an advocate for patients when they feel as though they're getting shorthanded uh, in a given situation. For example, the, the neuropsychiatric area uh, seems to be something which people find quite uncomfortable, uh, where a neurologist doesn't understand the psychiatric or psychological aspects of a problem, and a psychiatrist doesn't understand the, the neurological impact or basis. So I'm, I'm finding greater ease uh, and, and comfortableness in uh, understanding the uh, trials and tribulations of a child uh, reaching out, but unable to really uh, vocalize or, or, or be very specific about uh, what bothers them. And in general, who is your, who is your patient per se? Like, who, why would someone come and see you? Well, you know, I deal with the broad ranges of neurology uh, and neuroimmunology. So if you had a problem that you couldn't figure out, uh, chances are that your neurologist or your internist would give you one or several names. Uh, I might be one of those names if, if in their opinion, uh, I've had success in the past uh, in uncovering the sort of difficult patient diagnosis. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't relegate it to a specific area, although neuromuscular disease has long been my passion. So you're kind of like the Dr. House of neurology. You could say so. That's pretty cool. Um, so, you know, I, in the opening, I was saying that there are, you know, neurologic manifestations of Lyme disease as well as other, other illnesses like strep throat. Um, and, you know, I think this is an area that's both really interesting and also really confusing for a lot of people. Um, you know, strep throat is something that kids have all the time. And as parents, you know, we're told, oh, that they need antibiotics. But there isn't much understanding of what potential sequelae may exist for a child. And I think as a result, um, sometimes 
you know, diagnoses are missed. Um, can you explain to our listeners what it is that I'm talking about in terms of pandas, in terms of pans? Well, when one talks about pandas or pans, one's talking about a pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with beta hemolytic strep infection. That's PANDAS, abbreviated. Uh, if you're talking about PANS, then you're leaving out the beta hemolytic strep and saying there's another uh, infectious microbe that is stimulating the cycle of what we call uh, I cubed or I to the third power, uh, infection, immunity, and inflammation. And that's a general principle that's been uh, appreciated in medicine now for several decades. So, and how can children present, um, you know, for the parents out there who are saying, well, you know, what would my kid look like hypothetically? Were they in, were they suffering from this or these? Well, probably the, probably the classical presentation is a child that has new onset of tics and obsessive compulsive behavior. Uh, and and al- although that's not specific for a, for a given cause of infection, it is fairly uh, specific for a symptom complex, which may be related to um, a preceding strep infection or recurrent strep infection. And that's why they talk about pandas as being kind of a relentless um, presentation to the to the immune system of a beta hemolytic strep uh, infection. Uh, however, Lyme disease is a, while it's not beta hemolytic strep mediated, uh, the Lyme organism, Borrelia burgdorferi bacterium, can also start this cycle of I cubed. Now, you know, I think one question that has popped up for me is, is there is a certain age where a lot of kids develop ticks. Um, mm-hmm. where it's, it's not necessarily uncommon. So for a parent whose child has a, you know, a tick disorder, should every parent whose child has a tick disorder be concerned that there's an underlying infection? I don't think so. I think as parents, we, we like to be optimistic and, and we, we like to use our physicians as a comfort zones. And if you see your physician, with a symptom complex like that of of ticks without OCD, I think most physicians and and pediatricians would give you support and say, let's watch things and see how it goes. However, if if there's a a progressive nature to it uh, and uh, obsessive compulsive behavior accompanies it, and there's frank evidence of neurologic involvement, then I think we have to uh, put up our radar and wonder what's going on. And would a, you know, tick disorder in a child, are, are these kids who are previously, um, or I should say in pandas, are these kids who are otherwise um, anxious children? Or, you know, is there any kind of child who you would think of as being more um, likely to experience these symptoms? Well, I don't think there's a personality complex or even a personality disposition to uh, acquiring pandas. And it may even be found one day that pandas may even be a, a developmental uh, um, uh, passage in a sense, uh, given a certain type of immune system and given a certain type of genetic uh, makeup. The question, however, is it does the infection itself besides the ticks and OCD and pandas, does it lead to a more pervasive uh, involvement of the blood-brain barrier or the brain tissue itself? And that's where we like to get uh, a a little more detail about brain function uh, and and the rest of the nervous system, which you know includes not just the brain, but the uh, peripheral nerves and the autonomic system. So all together between central nervous system peripheral nervous system and the autonomic nervous system, we can try to understand all the various components. 
fascinating. We are we have to take a brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Seiner, and we are talking about various illnesses like Lyme disease, like strep, that can cause neurologic sequelae in children. And as parents, this is something we really need to know about because we need to advocate for our kids. So we're talking to Dr. David Younger, and when we return, we're going to discuss more about these illnesses and about treatment. So stay tuned. Baby boomers face many challenges, and sometimes you have to reinvent yourself in order to stay on top. Sharon Ball, nurse practitioner and Christian life and wellness coach, can help. Sharon has written a book called Reinventing Yourself Today, and it can help you through the pangs of changing the course of your life. Whether you are looking to stay on track with new goals, a sensible program to help you shed unwanted pounds, or a full kick-butt life reinvention, Sharon can work with you. Follow your passions and live each day according to your dreams and free yourself from the expectations of others. Sharon comes from the heart and shares her own personal journey to reinvention with her clients. Other self-help books inspired her, but few gave her the steps to improve her life, so she created a plan that works. Stress no more. Let Sharon Ball open the door. Sign up for a complimentary life reinvention consultation today at tinyurl.com forward slash get started for free for more of what life has in store. Unleash the obstacles that bind you with certified professional coach Joanne Charette, a master practitioner in energy leadership. Joanne can help you break through personal and professional barriers and guide you to a higher level of empowerment and fulfillment. Passionate and dedicated, Joanne engages with her clients on a mutual journey. Her dynamic energy will motivate you to move forward as you partner on a venture to greater results. Isn't it time to make a breakthrough and commit to live the life you deserve? Invest in yourself and let Joanne Charette be the catalyst to the realization of your dreams by making them a reality. Based in Quebec, Canada, Joanne is also a space coach using social media and Skype to work with anyone, anywhere around the world. Contact Joanne Charette today at 819-360-3266 or email her at actionrealization at live.ca 819-360-3266 Now is your time. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Sunner, and today my guest is Dr. David Younger, neurologist and epidemiologist, and we are talking about Lyme disease and other illnesses that can affect the brain. Don't forget, you can call live and ask anything directly to David or myself because our phone lines are open. Number is 855 856 one three eight zero. So before the break, we were talking about these illnesses, and maybe we could start by talking more about Lyme disease specifically, um, in terms of presentation and diagnosis. What can you tell us about Lyme disease? Well, Lyme disease is on the move. Uh, it, cases are increasing, and it's one of the many disorders that the uh, Centers for um, Disease Prevention. Uh, uh, the CDC follows and tracks um, each year and each each month of each year because it's an epidemic illness. Uh, so we have seen that while cases have only modestly increased in, in given years of the decade, it seems to be geographically more pervasive, covering larger portions of the uh, the Northeast and even into the the Midwest. So Lyme disease is, is not an um, innocuous um, disorder, uh, simply on an epidemiologic basis. Now, I, Lyme is obviously named after from Lyme, Connecticut, um, but it, it is a disorder that, as you said, is getting more and more pressed. But people hear about it, right? As parents were told to check you know, do tick checks and what have you. Let's say for the parent out there who says, well, I did tick checks and I have never found a tick on my child. So anything going on with him is definitely not Lyme disease. What do you say to that parent? Well, I think one has to be circumspect. Even a, a, a given tick bite uh, may be the clue that brings you to the point where you begin considering Lyme disease. But in point of fact, 
most people have probably been exposed to Lyme disease if they've been residing or vacationing uh, in, in tick endemic areas. Uh, the big problem we have in children would be summer camp. Uh, that's the time when city kids go into the country. And it's not so unusual uh, a history for a child to have a tick bite, to go to the camp nurse and say, look at this engorged tick. Uh, maybe they've already taken it off. Maybe the nurse takes it off. And then the assumption is if the tick is out, the disease must not be uh, likely to occur. But that's a fallacy. That is simply a, an important warning sign that it's um, that one probably needs to get a, a blood test at some point in the future, especially if symptoms arise. And when should a child have a blood test relative to finding a tick? Well, typically speaking, uh, within, within the month following a tick bite, the immune system begins producing antibodies against the organism, Borrelia burgdorferi. And there are two types. The first type is a rapidly changing antibody called IgM, and IgM stands for a heavy class of antibody immunoglobulin chains. However, over time, the immune system relegates the antibody response, like in a long-term archive, to an IgG class. And this IgG class will be much more pervasive in true infections. IgM antibody elaboration, on the other hand, can be somewhat nonspecific. It's early, it can peak within about a month, and then it slowly reduces. So there, there comes a time after a month or two months and before the rise of the IgG level, when it may be very difficult to diagnose Lyme disease. So prompt action and recognition are the bases for um, understanding Lyme in a given individual. But now, you know, Lyme disease is obviously not new, but the, there is a lot of controversy around it, correct? And at least... Um, my experience, there are definitely doctors who scoff at the diagnosis or they scoff that there's any um, long-term potential for you know, consequences. How should a parent who is concerned address this, you know, if their pediatrician says, oh, no, don't worry about it, it's, you know, it's not that, um, how can a parent move forward if they are concerned that their child may have been exposed to Lyme disease and, and in fact, may be symptomatic? Well, it's very hard to give each individual um, child and parents the peace of mind that they've been adequately treated. Uh, some of this depends upon the uh, uh, severity of the symptoms, uh, other, other factors that may be important in deciding the duration of antibiotic uh, therapy will be how well they tolerate it, um, with, with some kids being very intolerant of, of certain antibiotics. There's also an age issue. For example, doxycycline is not recommended therapy for youngsters. Uh, we go to uh, amoxicillin or, or cephalosporin uh, in the smaller age group, whereas doxycycline can be used in children that are uh, uh, older, you know, ab above the age of 8 to uh, 12 years old. Um, overuse of antibiotics has its uh, attendant risks because you can change the, the bacterial flora in your stomach and you can develop all kinds of uh, intolerances. You know, the, the one thing we don't always talk about is what we call the human microbiome. The human microbiome is all the organisms in our body that makes us a super organism, both the commensal bacteria that, that line the gut and, and give us a, um, a competent immune system uh, and an and intact lining. Uh, and then there are those agents which are trying to invade us and, and those are the ones that uh, we want to treat with antibiotics. Yet we don't want to sacrifice those important bacteria that protect us. We're, we're really a, a large, large superorganism, and giving too many courses of antibiotics 
sometimes increases the risk of disturbing what we call um, uh, the homeostatic balance uh, of organisms in our body. And correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, if giving your child probiotics with the antibiotics can sometimes help, correct? Well, probiotics are very useful. Uh, a, a problem, though, is that they haven't been found to be as effective as we believe them to be. Um, I think probiotics have an important use in prebiotics, and probiotics are, are all incredibly important. It's also important to get um, uh, live uh, bacteria from, uh, from food sources. Um, but we, you really, once you change the bacterial uh, composition of your body, it takes quite a while to, to reestablish it. Uh, and we see this in people that have uh, chronic immunosuppressive uh, illnesses, uh, like due to rheumatoid arthritis and other chronic uh, illnesses, where they're being uh, pummeled with uh, various uh, immune suppressive agents and sometimes antibiotics. So you're taking a child who has been otherwise uh, pristine and you have to make a decision, a, a very educated decision, uh, sometimes on, on its own merit. Sometimes you may be the one to make it or your pediatrician may help you to decide. Um, it's a very difficult balance. Now, you know, I think one question that would pop up for many is what are symptoms that parents should be looking for? Um, and if a child and attendant to that is if a child is not symptomatic, do they still need treatment? Well, I tend to think that children will find their niche. Uh, children who have difficulty at school, uh, changing uh, relationships with friends, children that become highly introverted, uh, staying, staying in their room, staying in bed, not wishing to confront the challenges that they've always uh, enjoyed. Those are some of the subtle personality changes that can go along with illness. Sometimes laying in your, in your bed, in your room, is a safe place. And we sometimes see this even in older kids, uh, teenagers, who go through kind of a, a regressive uh, period in their life. Um, and when we see them emerge from their room and from their bed uh, just before starting college or they're, in, or they're in high school and they're successfully treated, it's probably the most uh, encouraging uh, and emotional um, uh, send-off for, for a parent to see their child uh, regain society. Absolutely. And, and in the converse, it must be incredibly scary when a child goes from being highly functional and fine to all of a sudden having these, you know, personality changes. And and is it common for these kids to also have physical symptoms in terms of feeling sick? Well, what what we know is that if you uh, disturb functioning of the central nervous system, you're bound to have a plethora of symptoms. You can have something like headache, uh, cognitive changes, personality changes, memory loss. Uh, they may be doing poorly at school. Uh, if they involve uh, the spinal cord or the spine, they may experience neck pain or back pain or spasms. Uh, if they uh, have a tendon uh, involvement of the peripheral nervous system, uh, we hear about numbness, tingling, and weakness of the limbs. And if they have autonomic involvement, either because of the hypothalamo-pituitary-adrenal axis or because of the autonomic nerves, they can have something called orthostatic intolerance. And these are kids who have decreasing blood pressure when they stand up or when they uh, try to exercise. And there's another presentation that's equally intriguing, which is called POTS syndrome, postural orthostatic tachycardia. And such children complain of a racing heart. And that racing heart can feel a lot like a panic attack. And this amount of anxiety can sometimes lead children who don't have a clear understanding of what's happening to think that they're highly anxious. So fascinating because 
obviously you have a child who's not, and then all of a sudden they're complaining of anxiety, and as a parent, what do you do? We are going to take a brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Sunder, and we are talking about illnesses like Lyme disease that can have huge effects on kids and adults with Dr. Dr. David Younger. And don't go away because we are going to talk about another one called pandas. This is not the cute guys you see at the zoo. We're going to explain, so stay tuned. Hello, everybody. This is Coach Betty Louise, and I have a question for you. When is the last time you looked in the mirror and saw your amazing beauty and sexuality? 80% of women do not have a positive body image. 97% of women do not like something about their bodies, and over 10 million women have eating disorders. In addition, at least 40% of women are sexually repressed and one in seven marriages are sexless. I've just completed a book called Healing with Pleasure Medicine. What I will teach you is what gets in the way of your ability to see your beauty, sensuality, and sexuality. How to shift your perception to increase pleasure throughout your entire day. Okay, the place to find all of this information is Coach Betty Love. Live.com. One more time, CoachBettyLive.com. Look forward to connecting. Animal lover, author, artist, and public speaker, Patricia Daly Life is a Renaissance woman in her own right. A lover of animals from a young age, Patricia lives on a farm in Virginia and has rescued neglected thoroughbred horses, keeping them or finding them safe havens. She is also a published author, and her books document real-life experiences that she shares in her passionate stories, taking the reader around the world in a colorful kaleidoscope of life. An accomplished artist, Patricia Daly Life's oil paintings feature animals, portraits, stills, nature, and abstract, and she allows the brush to paint the image in an organic, natural way. A public speaker, Patricia is motivated to continually wonder about life and advocates for all of us to do the same and document our own unique history. To learn more about Patricia Daly Life, visit www.literarylady.com and www.patricialife.com or email her at pdlife at gmail.com. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Slender, and today my guest is Dr. David Younger. Do you have a question? Call us, 855-856-1380. And so before the break, I mentioned pandas, and that this is not, we're not talking about the cute little bears at the zoo. What exactly am I talking about? Well, these are children and adolescents, which I mentioned have obsessive compulsive disorders, that have exacerbations with strep infection. But in the case of pans, it can be due to any uh, invading microorganism. And that sets up a child for ticks and OCD and a, uh, a neurological presentation that can be fairly uh, encompassing for the child. And does this wax and wane? Is this a child who's okay one day and not the next? Exactly. And in fact, some people even even recall the first instance of when their child awoke with a certain set of symptoms like this. But, you know, it, it does get better over time as the, and as the infection resolves. And as there's recurrent infections, there can be exacerbations. And sometimes these spells can last for weeks or months. And it's when it kind of blends into a, a, a state of not getting better that parents become fairly upset uh, and worried, and then they seek medical attention. And does there have to be a documented strep infection? So if there isn't one, then we just, we're going to put it under as PANS. And if there is a documented strep infection, then it's PANDAS. Is that correct? That's correct. And you do have to find uh, immunologic uh, evidence of strep uh, exposure. And so blood tests become especially useful. We can look for certain things in the blood that say that the child has had an exorbitant exposure to strep, uh, the, like the anti-streptolysine antibody titer, the DNA-B's antibody titer, 
Uh, and then there are some other more esoteric antibodies that are recommended uh, in certain situations, which they believe may have some relation to antibodies that cross-react with elements uh, in, in the brain. And, and these are in, in various panels uh, that are available uh, in commercial laboratories. Now, if a parent, you know, if a child had strep throat and it was documented and then it was treated at the time of the infection, will that prevent the development of pandas? No, it doesn't. The problem is that in some children who still have their tonsils, uh, they can have uh, pockets within the tonsils that lead to surviving strep uh, organisms that are kind of beyond the reach of antibiotics. Uh, and then there's always a situation of being partially treated. So it's very important when a child goes to a pediatrician and the pediatrician does what's called a rapid strep test, followed by a culture, that you not treat everything unless it's really a proven infection and that you stay on the antibiotics for the entire period recommended by the physician. The problems we sometimes encounter, though, is if you're on antibiotics at the time you get a recurrence or you've been taking frequent antibiotics, you may not have a positive culture. And then things become a little unclear. And then it becomes a question of instinct on the behalf of the pediatrician as to whether or not someone is experiencing recurrent infections so close together that uh, they're almost indiscernible from one another. Now, does every pediatrician um, agree with this as a possible diagnosis? Um, my understanding, there's a fair amount of controversy, correct? There really is. And a really seasoned, solid pediatrician will probably understand these, these questions and try to clarify it for moms and dads. It's so important for parents to leave the visit understanding all of the nuances associated with this uh, disease. And so uh, I, no, I would just add that it, it's, it, it's really almost a, a debriefing that has to occur um, with the pediatrician and the parents so that there is a uh, clear understanding of when to uh, get back in touch and what to look for in a given child. So for the parent who is listening, whose child had strep throat, and then shortly thereafter developed, you know, these new onset ticks and obsessive compulsive, you know, symptoms or anxiety. And let's say they go to the pediatrician and they say, you know, I'm, I'm concerned. And the pediatrician says, oh, no, it, it's just a tick disorder or, or your child is just anxious. How can a parent know whether their pediatrician at that moment is correct, or if, in fact, there's another cause for the symptoms being pandas that really will benefit from treatment? Well, that's really an excellent question, because what you're suggesting is that if you lose confidence in the judgment of your doctor, then you're sort of on your own. And that's where a lot of parents experience most of their anxiety is not being sure that they're being told everything. Is their pediatrician holding back something or do they just not know? Uh, and so it, it's so important to kind of uh, decipher and to sit and listen to your pediatrician. If they appear dismissive, that may be because they're not interested uh, or they don't know, uh, or they may have a, a presumption that uh, that you're overreacting, um, but fear not in your own instinct. As a parent, you know your child the best, and you have to keep on plugging away. And I find myself sometimes acting as a parent and a child advocate for other, other physicians treating that child to sort of say, well, you know, the parent has told me that they're very worried about X, Y, or Z, and they don't feel like they're getting the entire answer. 
And if I get a response back from that doctor that says, well, they're just hypochondriacs, they're, they're worrying about everything, I'll, I'll try to set the record straight and say, well, you know, you may have some factual basis in that, but this may be an unusual situation that's really driving them close to the edge. And if a parent's instinct is, you know what, this is not okay, this is not just a tic disorder, or, you know, there's something else going on here, is there a treatment that they should be asking about that may benefit the child? Well, you, you raised a very interesting question, and this is where it gets a little unclear. Um, there are antibiotics, of course, in the, in the treatment of pandas and pans, and then there's something called immune modulatory therapy, and that seems to be something which has become important over the past decade or so as we've understood the fact that the immune system is really the, uh, the perpetrator here. It's not the strep that's infecting the nervous system. It's the immune system that's being activated by the organism. And if you want to then set the record straight and tell the immune system that it doesn't have to overreact, things are, are where they should be, the, the use of Im immune modulation becomes an important aspect of treatment. So the first stage being the antibiotics, that stage is not, in fact, to treat the infection as much as to allow the brain time and the immune system time to kind of recoup from, you know, and kind of prevents another infection. Is that right? Well, this is where timing is everything. You, you give appropriate antibiotic treatment for an appropriately diagnosed infection or you decide to use what's called prophylactic antibiotics, which means you put the child on either a more liberal uh, course of antibiotics, not waiting for the culture each time, but starting antibiotics off early in the course of infection. And some kids who have relentlessly uh, recurring infections may actually be put on uh, chronic antibiotics. Of course, there's all those attendant risks I mentioned before uh, of, of doing that. And then uh, beyond antibiotics may be something like immune modulation. And what, what, what appears to be a very popular uh, treatment now, uh, which is being used with, with some discretion, is uh, intravenous immune globulin or subcutaneous immunoglobulin. And the reasons why we would normally go to that treatment would be in children who have something called combined variable immune deficiency, CVID. These are ch children that have deficiencies of all the major antibody classes and have recurrent bacterial infections, oftentimes presenting as um, respiratory infections. And then you can have subclass deficiencies in all of these major antibodies, some of them can be quite esoteric. For example, an, an IgA deficiency that disturbs the gut flora. Uh, one can have IgG subclasses, probably the commonest um, affliction, which then leads to disturbances in the way you fight infection. And so giving back a judicious course of uh, immunoglobulins, whether be it by intravenous route or by the subcutaneous route, can sometimes help to reestablish immune competence and shift the balance from uh, immune aggression to more of a uh, immune homeostatic state. And how long do kids need to be on IVIG? Well, this is this is where it differs among experts. Um, I like to think of it as a process that needs to be judiciously watched and carefully administered. So we give this kind of therapy um, under very careful um, uh, supervision. Typically, we involve the pediatrician or we have an immunologist, allergist working with us. Uh, we taper it to the child's weight. Um, and we uh, make sure that we don't have any side effects that would um, uh, affect their normal functioning, and we give it once a week 
uh, or twice a month in, in consecutive days for three months. And then we re-examine our accomplishments. Wow. And you really hope that it, it worked. Um, most of the time, I imagine it does. We're going to take a brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and we are talking about illnesses that can affect the brain. And when we return, we're going to talk more about treatment and about advocacy for your child if you are concerned that they may have one of these illnesses. Stay with us. Horses, mystical, present, past, and future, all in one. Wild, free, domestic, and healing for everyone. Betty Hames knows this and has put her horses to good use with Nature Connect Equine Coaching. Her mission is to help people affected by the loss of hope and trust in their lives and to rediscover the wonders of nature through nature-connected learning so they can rebuild their lives and live peacefully with newfound hope, trust, and joy. Betty Hames is also a certified elite life coach, a Washington State certified counselor, and chemical dependency professional. She is passionate about partnering nature with healing, and through horses, she sees amazing results and transformation in lives that might have otherwise been lost. Call 509-830-9225 and visit her at HamesLifeCoaching.com. Hold your horses. You're in for the ride of your life. Are you looking for employment and live in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties? Jobs Annex is the place for you. Are you an employer looking to fill a position or quite a few positions in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties? Jobs Annex is for you. Employers, JobsAnnex.com is your resource for career-minded people. JobsAnnex.com is the convenient place for job seekers and employers to hook up and move forward. Jobs Annex has been serving Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties for over 14 years. Jobs Annex is a former employment search firm. We've evaluated many thousands of resumes and we understand what employers want and what job applicants need to be successful in their interviews. At Jobs Annex, we provide you with the tools to tell your story for free. Our resources at JobsAnnex.com will help each applicant construct an award-winning resume, an eye-catching cover letter, and key interview questions to ask in various types of interviews. Best of all, it's free. JobsAnnex.com. That's J-O-B-S-A-N-N-E-X.com. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and today my guest is Dr. David Younger, who's a neurologist, and we've been talking about various illnesses that affect the brain and how parents can, you know, identify if there may be a concern. Of course, we always want to reinforce that the parents do not have to be the doctor and you as a parent don't have to play the role of the pediatrician as much as I think it's really important for parents to feel empowered to help their child in the setting of concern. Would you agree? I agree a hundred percent. Now, I think one thing parents do face is that there is a lot of controversy, as I said earlier, and can you speak to why people question the diagnosis of pandas in that, you know, for example, strep throat is well known as a cause of rheumatic fever and cardiac issues. And really no one questions that at all. And, you know, that is probably the top reason why it is so commonly treated with antibiotics for a short course is to prevent that um, sequelae. Yet, as physicians, there is a lot of uncertainty regarding this diagnosis. Why is that? Well, you know, I think it goes more to the question of, is the pediatrician comfortable in making a diagnosis that has implications? Uh, And should they be referring that patient to a neurologist or a pediatric neurologist? So part of it is really a a matter of their comfort zone in saying, well, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but y- this is the diagnosis, and this goes beyond my normal expertise. Uh, and, and, but but I, I do see that as an important uh, avenue for getting more information. So people should feel encouraged if their doctor says, you know, I'm not 100% sure, 
but I know about this diagnosis and I'd like you to see a specialist. And that's where I might come in or where someone else might, uh, might enter. So there's that issue of being uncomfortable making a diagnosis, diagnosis that has implications. The second thing is I think that parents and, and physicians alike don't feel quite comfortable when there are neuropsychiatric elements to it. The one thing that tends to offend parents is when you use the word neuropsychiatric or neurobehavioral. The word neuropsychiatric makes them think that they're having a psychiatric problem. The word neurobehavioral, on the other hand, suggests that it's a very severe problem that um, is caused by uh, a disorder of the brain. However, we, we know now and know well that there's an incredible amount of plasticity. And even if there are uh, afflictions uh, of the brain, that most children will do very well over time. Even those that have the most uh, profound um, uh, illnesses, uh, so long as it's being managed in a, a conservative uh, and a pervasive way. Uh, sometimes being too uh, enthusiastic about a, a, a disorder can lead a parent to reach sort of indiscriminately for quick cures. Uh, and so I, I would say that if you're in the hands of a good physician who's thinking about things and guiding you slowly through the, through the process, recognizing when children are getting better uh, and dealing with them as individuals, you're probably in very good hands. Child will be better, right? That it, this is not a uh, necessarily a chronic illness that is going to overtake a child's life, correct? That's correct. It's time limited and the prognosis is excellent. I think that that is, I'm sure, very reassuring for parents to hear um, because, of course, all we want to do is protect our kids, right? And then in the setting of um, illness, we often feel very um, scared and very worried about the future as much as about now. So to be able to tell parents that the future is going to be okay must make you know the now a little bit easier to handle. Exactly, and it's so important to give psychological and psychoeducational support. It's not such a bad thing if a child stays home from school and has in individual attention from a visiting teacher during the period when they're ill. Um, but you know, sometimes parents feel as though they must send their children to school no matter what. And some, sometimes it's the school's problem in the child not attending because they feel as though something is being accomplished at home behind their backs. So when doctors speak to, to uh, parents and teachers and keep the lines of communication open with school, everyone benefits. That makes a lot of sense, and I think it's important to reinforce that as a parent, your job is to connect all the dots in terms of, you know, tell the teacher what's going on and, you know, make sure that they appreciate the situation as well as being in touch with a pediatrician that, you know, um, schools don't always necessarily know what's going on, obviously, unless you tell them. And kids are not going to be the best way to impart information that as parents, it's our job to do that. Um, but also that you can reach out to your physician to help you in the process, correct? Exactly. And I, on my, on my website, I try to blog as much as I can and, and talk about these uh, areas so that uh, people are not struggling on the internet to find the answers. You know, the internet is not a, a terrific place for finding you know, factual information that really applies to your specific situation, especially in the realm of epidemiology. It's not meant to be a, epidemiology is not meant to be uh, a, a, a good guide for an individual patient, but a good guide for the population. So when, as epidemiologists, our job is to kind of uh, look at the horizon and say, where are we with a given a disease. Uh, do we see it magnifying? Do we see it receding? Do we see its understanding becoming uh, more comprehensible or, or more fuzzy 
because there are nuances we never appreciated. And that's in contradistinction to a physician seeing one individual patient and ascribing all the multitude of presentations that he's seen or she's seen over time uh, in, in grappling with this singular diagnosis. It's such an important, important message because I think obviously everybody wants as much information as possible, but you need to remember that the information that will benefit your child is about your child. And, you know, Dr. Google may not, and actually most of the time <laughs> is not the right resource for you. But you need to trust your physicians and trust that your child is in the best care and best hands. So... Well, you have hit the nail square in the head. On your computer, call your doctor and say, hey, what does this mean? What does that mean? Educate me so I can also educate my child and the school and everybody else. And so we're all on the same page. Now, if a, if a parent is out there and um, they are interested in finding you, how can they do that? Um, David S. Younger, uh, MD. Um, I have a, a, it's, it's on your site. The link is on your site. Uh, and they can also call me at 212-213-3778. Uh, I'm always available, uh, to speak to people to, um, they don't even have to come into the office. A friend of yours is a friend of mine. Oh, thank you. Well, you are amazing, Dr. David Younger. He, thank you so much for joining us today. This was an incredibly informative and valuable show that I hope has led to greater understanding and advocacy for our kids. And thank you to our listeners for joining us today. Tune in again next week and every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network and tune in radio. And remember, you can always get in touch with me. I'd love to hear from you. This has been an episode of MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Till next time, be well, enjoy life, and thanks for listening. You've been listening to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Please join us each and every week for answers to the many challenging issues moms face today on the next episode of Dr. Carly's MD for Moms. been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.